So today we're going to go over a little bit about like my background growing tomatoes. We're going to get into the full process of growing tomatoes. And then um, we're going to look at how to eat tomatoes. Like we're just going to review how to eat tomatoes. And then at the end, we're going to go over some frequently asked great questions centered around tomato growing. We'll go ahead and kick it off with 2019, my year growing tomatoes. I spent a lot of time learning from farms, reading books. Gotcha. I'm, I'm trying. Um, it was my second year of gardening, and I was growing about 70 to 75 pounds of tomatoes in one about like five to six foot square garden. Um, these are black cream tomatoes, great little hybrid variety to grow. I was beyond satisfied with my results from researching all these different ways of growing tomatoes, primarily from farms. In 2020, I was putting tomatoes on the back burner. I wasn't pruning as much as I should have been. I wasn't preventing diseases as much as I should have been. And I scaled back my tomato plants significantly. And I tried to grow only cherry tomatoes this year. I was moving houses, just moving them. some tomatoes to take with me before I moved. Um, but I still got amazing yields. Even though the plants were all sick, I still got plenty, plenty of fruit, plenty to share too. In 2021, I grew exclusively in containers. I had about 12 containers and still yielded about 70, 75 pounds of tomatoes. So it doesn't matter what your context is, you can grow way too many tomatoes. <laughs> All right, today's goal, I'm gonna give you the best practices possible to grow the most amount of tomatoes as possible. And you yourself will decide where you land on that spectrum of like the most amount of effort to the least amount of effort based on your personal contexts. And with that said, let's grow tomatoes. We're gonna look at the different varieties. Uh, typically there are determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. Determinate tomatoes are tomatoes that only grow about five feet, cross probably a little shorter, somewhere between three and five feet. And those give you tomatoes for a determinate period of time, typically about two to three weeks. And they'll tell you on the seed packet or on all the tomato information that It'll take about 70 days to get to maturity and then dump tomatoes for about three weeks. And then the plant's just done. And it's time to pull it out, kill it. Even if it looks beautiful, even if it looks like it's about to fruit more, it's pretty much done. Uh, indeterminate tomatoes are tomatoes that will keep on growing and keep on producing fruit all the way until the plant shocks from frost and dies. There have been like 50 year old tomatoes that are just indeterminate tomatoes. As long as you can keep them alive, they'll keep going. You can pack it off at the bottom, bring it indoors pull it back out for next season and you just have two-year-old tomatoes, three-year-old tomatoes. They're not necessarily annuals. Uh, to indeterminate tomatoes take a lot more effort than determinate tomatoes. So we're primarily gonna discuss those in today's workshop. You're gonna look at the varieties. We have them listed here. We have our air, our beef steak slash slicers. Those are interchangeable terms. A beef steak is a slicer. A slicer is a beef steak. We have cherry tomatoes. We have grape tomatoes. We have Roma slash long tomatoes. Those are pretty much interchangeable. Heirloom tomatoes and cocktail tomatoes. Heirloom tomatoes are a breed of tomato that have been preserved without any crossbreeding for about 40 years or so. If you have 40 years, you can create your own tomato and it will become an heirloom eventually. Um, these are sort of the tomatoes that all the gardeners say are the best to grow. Anytime you talk to a gardener who grows a lot of tomatoes, they're telling you, I'm growing exclusively heirlooms. I'm not growing hybrids. Hybrids come from the more technical scientific crossbreeders and are bred with like different kinds of aspects more on the chemical side and the scientific lab side as opposed to just taking two plants and mashing them together. Um, heirlooms are championed as possibly being the best tomato to grow in the garden, but they're not without their downsides. Heirloom tomatoes can be more susceptible to diseases they can produce a little bit less than their hybrid counterparts, and they can just take a longer time to grow. So if you're thinking about hybrids, if you're thinking about doing exclusively heirlooms, there are gifts and takes to all situations. There's no such thing as the best tomato to grow. All right, cherries and grape tomatoes. So both are very small, very sweet, and are easier to grow than their larger counterpart. If it's your first year growing tomatoes, I would say maybe pick a smaller tomato. These will produce a lot more tomatoes, a lot easier. And if you're a little bit more of like, I want to be not as active in the garden, these are gonna be your tomatoes. It doesn't matter if they get a little sick, if they get a little ignored, 
these tomatoes will constantly produce pretty, pretty consistently. Cherry tomatoes are very sweet and they tend to have a lot more juice than any other tomato. They're most commonly used in like fresh preparations, salads, uh, caprese's, those sorts of things. Grape tomatoes are gonna be a lot more ovicular and they're gonna have a better balance of like sweetness, acidity, flesh, and juice. So that's a good just overall tomato to, to grow. I also find them personally to be the very best tomato for sun-dried tomatoes. And you can do sun-dried tomatoes in the sun or in your oven at like the lowest setting for a couple of hours and you'll you'll get good shelf-stable sun-dried tomatoes. Austin. What's up? Which of those were in that picture are the grapes and which are the cherry? <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's really only one or two grapes. Yeah, up at the top. Left, you can see that longer tomato is a grape tomato, and pretty much all the rest of them are cherries, except for the one at the top right, which is also a grape tomato. Good question, thank you. All right, cocktail and long tomatoes. Cocktail tomatoes are ones that are cherry shaped, but they're a lot larger than a cherry. They're somewhere between a cherry and a beefsteak tomato. It's probably the least common tomato you'll find, but uh, it's widely used in like salads. It'll it'll give you it's usually about that big, just just ever so slightly bigger than a golf ball, but not necessarily a beefsteak size. Long tomatoes are ones with a lot more flesh than juice, and that's what's mostly used whenever you're making your Mediterranean slash Italian tomato sauce. And it's also widely used in Mexican salsas and stuff like that. So if you're trying to get your salsa game up, you're gonna to wanna to grow your long tomatoes or your Roma tomatoes. Preparation and support. I personally like to use bamboo stakes. There, I usually get some that are about seven to nine feet tall so I can stick it about a foot in the ground. And that way I'll just wrap my tomato along the bamboo stake as it grows upwards. And I will harness that with a Texas style tomato cage. A Texas tomato cage is what you can see over here. It is more square and it's usually about five feet tall. Do not use tomato cages to grow tomatoes. <laughs> you can use tomato cages to grow peppers, but if you try to put a seven foot tall tomato in a three foot tall cone, it's gonna laugh at it, it's gonna fall over, it's gonna die, you're gonna be sad. <laughs> That's why I like to use the Texas tomato cage. Regardless of what plane you go with, <laughs> give a little pause. Your plant should prioritize a structure that will have your tomato plants about six to seven feet tall and be able to hold quite a lot of weight. If you were growing a big beefsteak tomato, that plant is seven feet tall with a bunch of fruit. We're looking at 30, 40, 50 pounds of fruit. And um, you're going to want to make sure that it's nice and sturdy. In 2019, you saw those nice big slicer tomatoes I had. We had really strong winds for July. We're talking 60, 75 mile hour winds. And I was terrified that my tomato plants were gonna get snapped off at the stem and just be dead all over the floor. But my Texas tomato cages and my bamboo stakes held firm and we got there in the end. More trellis types. You can use an arbor to get a nice hanging tomato. You can go out and find an arbor. Uh, cattle panels, which are sort of like chicken wire, but a lot sturdier, a lot, uh, a lot bigger of a grid than a smaller grid. And those are good. You can just stick that whole thing in the ground with a little bit of support and you can grow your tomato right up that. Nylon netting is really common. You'll find those in all your garden centers. And yeah, they're at the natural gardener. I've seen those plenty. And you can just weave your tomato through it as you, as you like. Uh, lean and lower is the most common practice in tomato farming where they'll put some string up on the roof. They'll hang their tomato from the string. And as the tomato grows up the string, they'll lower the string, leaning the tomato downwards, which will let you grow like a 30, 40 foot tomato, but keep it within a six to seven foot tall height. Uh, but with all that said, you shouldn't be intimidated by any of these trellis types. They're all really easy to do. And you can see on the picture there, we have what is called a Florida weave. Where you take two stakes and you weave some twine between them and keep the tomato nice and snug in that that we and as it grows up you'll just add another line of two line and it'll keep it nice and tight all right let's go shopping 
I usually start tomato seeds indoors in late January, mid to late January. Some people do it at Christmas. Some people do it at New Year's. I like to do it around January 10th is when I start my tomato seeds indoors. Uh, and you want to look for seeds that come from as close to a climate as yours. If you're getting tomato seeds from Italy, they're used to the Italian climate. They're not used to Texas climate, so they're going to have a really rough time. So I like to try to find whatever my seeds are sourced from. I try to make sure they're as close to me as possible. All right. And then early to mid spring, we'll start looking for transplants in the nurseries. I want to say next week, you should start seeing these things in the nurseries. Uh, I talked to a friend at Lone Star Nursery. They'll probably have transplants ready to ship to your door uh, around February 20th. So yeah, about next week. Uh, be sure to look for short and leafy transplants. You should avoid any plants that have flowers and fruit. I've been there. I've been to Whole Foods. They have the beautiful little tomato plant. It's this tall. It's loaded with fruits and flowers. You do not want that tomato. That tomato plant is going to have a really hard time, and it's been pumped full of every single fertilizer known to man. So it's short, and it's confused. It's making flowers. It's trying to grow. It's trying to make fruit. And its energy is completely thrown in every direction, and nothing is done productively with that plant. You can get one of those plants, but if you do, I would take off all the flowers. I would take off all the fruit and try to get that tomato to grow as big as you want it to before you switch over to fruiting. You should avoid any sort of tall and leggy tomato transplants. Those probably have been a little bit devoid of light. And so they're searching for light. They're getting a little weak. They're getting a little leggy. And you also want to make sure that your tomatoes aren't root bound. A, a weak transplant can make for a weak end plant, essentially. But that isn't to say that if you do get a poor transplant, if you do get a really poorly taken care of tomato that has a bunch of fertilizer pumped into it, you can still get great tomatoes with those. It's just something to be mindful of. All right. You should only plant your tomatoes when there is no more chance of frost outside. I'm seeing a bunch of people right now. They're like, it was a beautiful weekend, so I went ahead and planted all my tomatoes. It's still <laughs> the middle of February. We still have a whole month and a half before you dare check the weather to do that. But luckily, those people are big patrons of all of our garden nurseries, and so they're just going to buy more when <laughs> their first round inevitably dies. And also, a little side note, we are still at a really low amount of sunlight per day. As we get closer to the summer, we're going to get more and more sunlight every day. So if you plant your tomatoes early, they're not getting much sunlight anyway. So it's better to just wait until you have no chance of frost. Around end of March, early April, that's when I'll start monitoring the weather. I'll fill on the weather forecast. I'll check a monthly forecast. If there is a frost date, I'm not putting my tomatoes out. I don't care if it's going to get 31. <laughs> I'm not putting my tomatoes out. Once there is no more chance of frost, that's when I'll plant out. I don't care if it's end of April. You, you will be happier if you wait until after the first, after the last frost date. Sorry. Um, you can see in this photo, there are all these little hairs along the stem, and those can all eventually turn into roots. If those hairs come into contact with any amount of soil, they will immediately turn into roots. So you can plant your tomato as deep as possible, and that's what we really want to do. Uh, if I have a transplant that's about two feet tall, I'll try to plant that thing a foot and a half in the ground. I will strip all the leaves off until it's only about five, six inches popping out of the ground. And that'll give a, the root zone a huge head start. You will get a much better root zone. You'll get a much better stem structure if you plant your tomato as deep as possible. Don't take off all the leaves. Still needs some leaves. But try to strip down everything that's not in like the top 15% of your plant. Do you plant them vertically or do you lay them down under the ground and bring it out? I love that question. We're going to come back to it. I like to plant it at like a gentle curve, like a, like a soft J. I like to plant my tomatoes. Because that'll also give it another dimension of strength. If your tomato plant is put in straight down, a weight comes over, it knocks it down. If your tomato plant is planted at a curve, it'll have much easier time bending and moving with the winds. All right. So, yes, we'll try to plant that as deep as we can. And then, completely optional, I've had tomatoes, I've had years growing tomatoes where I fertilized heavily. I've had tomato years where I fertilized not at all. 
and I've had great yields, whichever way. So it's up to you if you want to fertilize and how you want to fertilize. Maybe go get some of Russell's seaweed. I'm sure the tomatoes will love it. Uh, you want to prioritize a heavy nitrogen fertilizer, not a phosphorus or potassium fertilizer. A lot of first fertilizers will tell you what they do, and you want to focus on vegetative growth, not fruiting. If anything says use this for fruiting, get away from it. We don't want any flowers or fruit as we are growing our tomato plant. The idea is we're going to get that tomato plant. We're going to focus all of its energy into getting to its mature size before we work on fruit. It's like you don't want to be building a factory and making your production of the factory products while you're building it. You got to build the factory first, and then you can start pumping out products. And that's the general idea. All right. So understanding energy and how to control growth. Your tomato plants can be guided into being more productive with regular upkeep. I typically check on my plants twice a day, once as the day starting, once it's ending. Anybody who's grown any food in, in Austin, you realize that like, hey, I don't need to be out when the sun's out. If it's midday, if it's noon, I'm not gonna be outside. I'm gonna be outside when the sun's coming up. I'm gonna be outside when the sun's going down and nowhere in between. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look for suckers. A sucker is basically a new tomato plant that's growing off of your tomato plant. There'll be the main stem, there'll be a small branch, and in between those two, a little, little new bit of growth will pop up in the armpit of those two stems and branches. That, that uh, growth will turn into a new stem, and that stem itself won't make tomatoes, but it'll shoot off branches, and those branches will make tomatoes. So we don't really want that. We want a single liter tomato. We want just one nice, healthy stem, because if we let suckers go, that'll turn into another tomato, that'll turn into more vegetation, and the growth will just get out of control in ways you really don't want it to be. Uh, we're also gonna cut off all the shaded leaves. As I'm out there gardening, I'm just gonna like look at all the different angles. I'm gonna see what leaves aren't getting any amount of sunlight. I'm just gonna take them off. I typically have about bare stems, the, eight, the bottom eight inches of my tomatoes. That allows for a lot of really good airflow that keeps any sort of mold or humidity that you do not want in there. If it gets too humid, your tomato plant will be unhappy and you will start to see some health issues possibly. If you don't have that bottom eight inches or so free, you could start to see some mold build up on your tomatoes. And these are very, very spoiled plants. We've been spoiling these plants for millennia and they rely on you to keep them in good health. All right, keeping your plants healthy. Your plants rely on you to make sure they're in good health with regular maintenance and upkeep. You can make sure you avoid any harmful fungi, diseases, or molds. We're gonna be on the lookout for any sort of clumping, any sort of masses of leaves, any sort of moisture trapped is a bad sign. So if you're seeing any amount of vegetative mass clumped up together, pull some of it out, rip out some leaves, rip out some stems, whatever you need to do to make sure there isn't any sort of mass of tomato just clumped up. Uh, do not let any stems rub up against each other. These plants love to grow on the floor horizontally in a complete wild viney mass until they produce fruit, die, and just do it over and over again. So growing a tomato upright vertically is unnatural, but that's the best way we get tomatoes. And a lot of times, if there's any like stems rubbing up against each other, they're going to start to bruise each other. They're going to start to have an open wound. And an open wound on a tomato is a perfect, perfect storm for disease. We're also going to stay on top of our watering. Tomatoes, they like a bit of abuse. They like productive stress. So I'm not, I typically don't water my tomatoes very often. If you're watering your tomatoes every day, you're encouraging the roots to become more shallow. They're like, hey, I don't need to travel very far to get the water. You want to shock your tomato a little bit. You need to stress your tomato out and say, hey, I need to get some water or I'm gonna die. So it's gonna grow longer roots and more roots means more accessibility to nutrition. All uh, right. And I typically just like stick my finger in the ground. If it's bone dry, I'll hit it with water. Whenever I'm hitting it with water, I'll go about 10, 30 minutes. Sometimes I'll just be doing my garden stuff and I'll just let the hose go for about 40 minutes. And then I won't water for another two, three weeks. 
Do, 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 do. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure there's good airflow. Again, we want that bottom section of the tomato to be completely bare. We're trying to sculpt the ideal conditions through pruning. You need to prune your tomatoes or you're going to get diseases. There's, there's no way around it. Hello, not again. Okay. <laughs> All right. And with that said, we can start fruiting. After we've gotten our plants about six to seven feet tall, whatever our desired height is, we can do one optional thing, which is to chop off the top of the tomato. The tomato's main stem, if we cut it off, it'll get shocked. It'll say, hey, I'm under attack. And I need to start producing as many tomatoes as possible to pass down those seeds to keep my tomato lineage going on. And uh, so I'll typically wait till it's seven, eight feet tall. Whatever you think is like an uncontrollable height to you nearabouts, just chop that top off and it'll stop growing vertically. It'll still grow horizontally. You'll still get suckers and all the rest, but it'll stop growing vertically. Do, do, do. And you can pollinate the flowers yourself. The flowers have both male and female um, genes. So just giving any flower a little 10 second tickle will pollinate it and you'll get your tomato. Uh, an unpollinated flower will not produce a tomato, but these things basically do not need you to do so. A bit of wind, whatever little pollinator that you attract to your garden, they'll take care of it for you. But if you really, really, really wanna be on top of your tomatoes, you can just give every new little flower you see a little 10 second tickle. And then we can move. Yes, and then from there, we're actually going to move our fertilizer regimen to the exact opposite, where we were only focusing on nitrogen, no phosphorus, no potassium. We're going to do the inverse. We're going to start pumping in phosphorus and potassium, no nitrogen. Nitrogen is all your leafy green growth. Your potassium and your phosphorus are going to be overall plant health and fruits and flowers. And with all that said, best of luck. These are some of my favorites. Influencers in the YouTube space, you can see their YouTube channel names, Roots and Refuge Farm, how to grow the best tomatoes. It's a lady out of Arkansas. Oh. <laughs> mm. I mostly use like a hard, a hardwood mulch, definitely mulch your plants. If you're not mulching, you're going to be in some trouble. If you don't cover the soil, the soil will cover it for you. Nothing likes to be bare in terms of soil. Uh, pine needles works fine. I know you guys love your, your crushed pecan shells and I love the smell. Whatever mulch you can get that isn't like a dyed red or dyed black Lowe's Home Depot mulch, you can get some. There's a recycling center off of Pleasant Valley Road, I believe. And they have a, uh, a municipal mulch pile. You just go in there, grab a bucket, bring some home. And the next we have a uh, talk land. You got it. That's what it was. <laughs> uh, we also have Central Texas Gardener, the local PBS show. If you're not watching Central Texas Gardener, you absolutely should be. I'm on there. They, <laughs> they go around, they talk to everybody in the Central Texas gardening scene whether you're into ponds perennials flowers vegetables uh the natural gardener owner he's on there a lot really recommend that youtube channel and then we also have one yard revolution this is a guy in illinois and he does a lot of like small scale free reduced recycled resources and he gets amazing results and he gives it to you the most layman terms he tells you exactly what to do and he mostly grows like cherry and smaller tomatoes because his plot, unfortunately, only gets about five, six hours of sunlight a day. That is really bad conditions. You want your tomato plants to get at least eight hours of sunlight to be able to fruit. But he shows you even in the worst conditions, you can still get great production. And then the last one is self-sufficient me. This is a guy out of Australia. Kooky dude, but he makes really good YouTube content for growing food. And this is the video top five tips to grow a ton of tomatoes. I'm gonna go ahead and get my next. Oh, not five, please. Oh. And someone on the YouTube, or on our um, Zoom, they're asking for you to clarify how to trim suckers. 
Yes, uh, we will circle right back to that, but I just like to pinch them off as soon as I can see them. Suckers grow incredibly fast. If you see a sucker, you say, hey, I'll get to it later. Tomorrow, it'll be six inches. <laughs> they grow fast. But another thing you can do with your suckers is wait for them to get five, six inches of whatever, snip them off, put them in some dirt, give them to your friends. You're like, hey, I'm growing tomatoes. This is the tomato I'm growing. It's literally growing in my yard. Here you go. You can do it too. And we're also going to take some suckers. We're going to save those for when it gets really hot, put them indoors, and then we're going to replant our tomatoes for a late summer, fall, and winter tomato. But we're going to, we're going to get back to that. Do, do, do. Before we get into our frequently asked great tomato questions, I'm actually going to pull up a little video. We're going to watch about a third of it, and it's just going to cover um, how to eat a tomato. Some things to consider. It, it, it is something to, to note. This is one of my favorite series. Hello. This is America's Test Kitchen. They have a series called What's Eating Dan, where this fine gentleman talks about like his curiosity when it comes to eating certain vegetables. And he has an amazing resource when it comes to, um, hey, I don't know what to do with my kale. Hey, I don't know what to do with my okra. I don't know how to eat tomatoes correctly. And he goes over a lot of the things that you should, um, you should look at. Do, 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 do. I, I haven't unmuted it yet. There we are. At Cook's Illustrated, we have so uh -oh. many great recipes using tomatoes because the tomato is just the best. I'm not getting the audio through the when tomato season hits, I have to make a batch of senior editor Steve Dunn's fresh tomato sauce. It uses lots of tomatoes and a bushel of science to make a truly fresh tasting sauce. We start by having the tomatoes through their equator to expose pockets of jelly. The pockets run pole to pole, so slicing this way exposes each of them so it's easy to squeeze it out. Because this stuff is packed with glutamic acid, we are definitely not going to compost it. Whenever you're making a dish where the texture of the seeds embedded in the jelly would be a problem, you can strain the gel through a fine mesh strainer and capture it below just like this. Oh, and a quick little bit of myth busting. We aren't ditching the seeds because they are bitter, which they aren't. And if you don't believe me, try them for yourself. We just don't want their texture in the final sauce. We'll save a cup of this deliciousness for later. Then we process the tomatoes until smooth and add the puree to a pot with garlic, pepper flakes, and oregano. About 45 minutes over the heat, and we have four cups of lovely sauce. Now, at this point, your kitchen will smell incredible, which is pretty cool. But there's also a problem. Stick with me here. When you cook anything and it makes your whole house smell good, it means that aromatic compounds in your food are no longer in your food. They have volatilized into the air. One way to recapture the freshness of fresh tomatoes and bring back lost aroma compounds is to stir in our beautiful reserved tomato gel liquid stuff. With this sauce, we get the best of both worlds. Rich flavor because we removed lots of water and concentrated the stable aroma compounds that stay in the sauce, plus a big hit of fresh tomato aroma as we add back the volatile ones. There's another way to recover some of those aroma compounds using tomato leaves. If you have access to them, toss a handful of leaves into your sauce and steep them for 10 minutes before removing and discarding. The primary compounds responsible for the aroma of fresh tomato leaves are Z3-hexanol and 2-isobutylthiazole. Both are also found in fresh tomatoes. 2-isobutylthiazole is often isolated and added to a range of tomato products, such as ketchup, to bump up that freshness. So you know it's good stuff. Next up, tomato water. Now, if you dined in nice restaurants in the early 2000s, you've probably had your fair share of tomato water. It was kind of a thing on a lot of higher-end menus. It may have gotten a little played out, but I still love it. An innocuous-looking clear liquid with a yellow tint, tomato water absolutely pops with fresh tomato flavor and loads of umami. And it's simple to make. Just process tomatoes with a little salt, tie the mixture up in cheesecloth, and let it hang in the fridge overnight. What seeps through the cloth is super savory, sweet, acidic tomato juice without any of the pulp. It's a great way to use up a glut of in-season tomatoes. And you can use the pulp in tomato sauce. Tomato water makes an incredible and striking Bloody Mary, a great sauce for crudo, and a fabulous drink all on its own. Beyond sauce and water, make a lot of tomato sandwiches during tomato season. I like them simple, so that means tomato, griddle white bread, and mayonnaise. Cook's Illustrated senior editor, Lan Lan, uses some slick science for her recipe. She makes an all-purpose tomato seasoning with three quarters of a teaspoon cream of tartar, three quarters of a teaspoon kosher salt, 
half a teaspoon of sugar, and a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. Cream of tartar on a tomato? Look, I'll explain. Tomatoes taste their best when they strike a balance between sweetness and acidity. Cream of tartar adds a boost of acidity without any additional liquid or distinct flavor the way that vinegar or lemon juice would. Sugar helps with sweetness, salt helps you taste it all, and pepper adds a touch of warmth. Then we just griddle our slices of bread on one side for a little bit of texture, smear on the mayo, and add our tomato. You gotta have a nice thick slice. Mm, 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 that is so good. This is obviously best with a perfect tomato, but Lon's seasoning mix can elevate even less than perfect specimens. Finally, I gotta mention Lon's recipe for roasted tomatoes. It's another great way to preserve the season's bounty. Sliced, drizzled with oil and garlic, and roasted until concentrated and nearly falling apart. They are incredible. Store them in their tomatoey oil and use them on pasta, pizzas, and sandwiches, frittata, salads, and the list goes on and on. I have made myself so hungry today. So it's time to cook some spaghetti, toss it with our fresh tomato sauce, and a little bit of Pecorino Romano. I think I'll serve this up with a nice glass of tomato water. Whether you're popping cherry tomatoes in your mouth in the garden, roasting slices until tender, grilling up a sandwich, or dining in style like I am, this is definitely how to eat tomatoes. Thank you all so much for watching. It is prime tomato season, so I don't want to keep you any longer. Get out there, buy your tomatoes, and start cooking. Shoot. Um, so during the pandemic, I got into the game of wine, and oh, yeah. Tim Miller, one of the members, he grows uh, these yellow aromas. Mm -hmm. He gave me a whole bunch of them, and it was uh, tomato wine, um, and it tasted great, but the aroma smelled like stomach bile, and it just ruined the whole glass. Mm -hmm. So I'm you can so make what like what I've done to like change the chemistry. I think it might have been a sugar a sugar dilemma here because you can make wine out of pretty much any fruit like every state actually has their own wines like in alaska they use blueberries for wine and like hawaii they use pineapple for wine but a thing about any sort of alcoholic fermentation they need a lot of sugar and there's just not that much in a tomato versus pretty much any other fruit so if i was to give it a second run i'd maybe dump a bunch of sugar in there and see what happens yes that is something that is very important to note tomato leaves and tomato plants are a nightshade nightshade is poison but <laughs> there is a still a lot of beautiful smell off of a tomato leaf. If you go and rub a tomato leaf and you smell your fingers, you will get this powerful smell of tomato off of your fingers. But do not eat the leaves. They are not edible. He he discarded them. He steeped them in there, just sort of like a tea bag, and threw them away. I haven't tried it myself. <laughs> they are poison. They, <laughs> they are still technically poison. Use tomato leaves at your own discretion. Don't eat them. <laughs> great question. I will add that to my frequently asked great questions. Uh, yeah, it's always that problems with the absolute, which states um, all nightshade are indigenous to the Americas. Is, is that true to your knowledge? I would not know, but I know that most of the nightshades are New World foods. So like in Italy and in, in uh, the Mediterranean and stuff, they didn't have tomatoes until the Americas were being colonized. And it's really funny because they actually thought tomatoes are poisonous. People would eat tomatoes on copper plates and the copper plates with the acid of the tomato would poison and kill people. But there was one poor guy in Italy who was just like, I'm gonna die, I don't care, I'm gonna starve. So instead of starving, I'd rather die with a belly full of tomatoes and he just ate one raw and it was delicious. And that's how it got so popular. It went from something that was considered absolutely deadly. So one of the most amazing things you could eat in all of the Mediterranean. Great question, I love it. Yes, in sir. Diaz and um, write about deadly nightshade, Belladonna. Okay, so that we did free, yes. free, free but that might have been a nightshade that's a plant that's 
anywhere else. It's like a big genus. So it might not have been a brooding. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Those there's nightshades all over the world, but the food nightshades, I believe. Most cultures eat black nightshades, which we also think of as poison. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful who you eat. Yes. And potatoes are also a nightshade. I've also seen um, some. I've seen some fun people splicing a tomato and a potato. So they'll take a potato, they'll put it in the ground. As it's growing up, they'll cut it off, put a tomato top on it, and it'll grow a tomato and a potato at the same time. It's going to confuse the plant. You're going to get a weird freaking plant that doesn't know if it wants to make potatoes or tomatoes. So you'll get very little of both, but it's still fun to do. Um, and potatoes. Potatoes also have all those little hairs that we were talking about. So when you're planting potatoes, you plant them in the ground, foliage comes up, it's got all those, those beautiful little hairs. And what you do is you mound more dirt on it to get more potatoes. So those little hairs turn into roots again and you get more potatoes. Is there a name for that in botany? Those little hairs. I imagine there is, but I'm more of a armchair horticulturalist and not a botanist. All right. So how should I transplant? Five days prior to transplanting, you're gonna to wanna to strip off all the leaves. So we've started monitoring the weather. It's about March 20th. I'm looking at the weather. I found out, hey, on April 2nd, I know there's no more chance of frost. About five days out from April 2nd, I'm gonna strip off all those bottom leaves, leaving about the top 15, 10% of the leaves. This will give the tomato enough time to harden off those little wounds so you're not just ripping fresh wounds and putting them straight into dirt. You want your tomato leaves that you rip off to kind of have a day or three to, to solidify and harden off. And then we're gonna plant that thing as deep as we possibly can go. If you can go to China, go to China. Plant that thing as deep as you possibly can go. And I like to plant it in a very gentle curve. And again, that'll give it the best structure possible and a gigantic head start on the root zone. If you take your tomato plant out of the four inch pot, you see all those roots, you plant it exactly soil height, everything will be just fine. But it'll grow a little slower, a little less efficient, it'll be a little weaker and a little less strong under the hood. Do you pay any attention to the prevailing wind in the direction that you make the jetty? Uh, not necessarily, but you could. Um, wind's coming from all different directions, so it's hard, it's hard to tell. What do we do about those harsh summer heats? So there is no vegetable, there is no fruit, there is no nothing that wants to be out when it's 120 degrees. There's not. I mean, okra can take it. I, thought, I love growing okra, but my okra plants always like, but then you give them some water, they go right back. So definitely plant okra through the summer months, but you might still see some issues depending on how hard of a summer it's gonna be. We've had mild summers, we've had hard summers. You just never know. Every year is gonna be a little different. So tomatoes will struggle immensely through the July and August months. Worse so, any tomatoes, tomatoes just won't produce fruits if it's 68 degrees or hotter at night. And during July and August, pretty much every night is 80 degrees. So you will get no flowers, you will get no fruits. Throughout those entire two months, you will not get tomatoes. You might, but you most likely won't. And uh, what's even worse is that um, if your tomato plant is sick, if it's dying, if it's looking really raggedy, if it's brown, it's going to have a much harder time surviving through those summer months into cooler temperatures and producing. A sick plant won't produce as well as a healthy plant, but a sick plant can still produce. Ideally, we want to plant our tomatoes as soon as possible, but only as soon as possible, not earlier than as soon as possible. <laughs> um, so again, we will start our seeds in mid to late January. We'll plant outside when there is no longer a chance of frost around late March, early April. And from there, we will guide, we will very actively guide very productive green growth to get to fruiting size and then work on fruiting. So we want to start our plants as soon as we can. We want to put them outside as soon as we can, but not too early. We want to guide them very productively, taking off suckers, taking off shaded leaves, doing our pruning, getting our plant to mature size, and then getting to mature size, focusing straight on fruiting. So if you follow these exact processes, you will get the most amount of tomatoes possible. But it's very active. You're going to be out there in the garden plenty of times a week. 
I love to pruning tomatoes. It feels like sculpting to me. And in the summertime, I just go out and I'll do my tomato thing at like 10 p.m. I'll, I'll grab a beer, I'll put on a headlamp, I'll put on some music, and I'll just have a really weird fairy-esque time out there. <laughs> you can't get sunburned if the sun's on the other side of the world. All right. And before those harsh triple digit, triple digit temperatures, what we'll do is we'll take some suckers, we'll let them get six, seven, 10 inches long, cut those off. We're gonna bring those inside. You're gonna bring your tomato suckers inside and those are gonna replace your diseased tomatoes that are already outside suffering in the heat. You can cut those off automatically. You can let the tomato go to see if it can go, but you're gonna want some backup tomatoes, some replacement tomatoes to carry that baton after temperatures start to fall. And what, talk about falling temperature. What, what, is tem what temperatures are those? As soon as it's under 65 outside, I'll put a tomato plant out there. At night. Yeah. And that, that'll still wind up being like 98, 99 mm -hmm. in the daytime. But as long as it's nighttime temperatures under 65, under 68, you'll be good to go. All right. What are suckers and where are they? A sucker is basically a new tomato plant growing off your tomato plant. It's going to be an exact tomato plant, but just growing this way. And then you get another one growing this way. And before you'll know it, you'll just have this huge mass of vegetation that is clumping, that is rubbing up against each other, that is producing more suckers that you can't see. And it's just going to be a big ball of disease, but it'll still make tomatoes. It'll just ramp further into disease as you get closer. So you can see here my little perfect art diagram. We have our main stem, we have our off branch, and directly in between those, it'll be comical. It's right there in the armpit of this, of this uh, intersection. And it's always gonna be like that. You will always find your suckers in between the stem and the branch. A lot of people say, screw it, I'll just leave them. You can do that, that's fine. You'll still get tomatoes, but you're gonna get a much bigger plant. It's gonna get sick a lot faster. You take off every single one of them. I try to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Again, these are all best practices, which are kind of impossible to do. You just kind of have to know where the goal is and figure out where you are aligned with that. You're like, ah, I'm too busy today to go get suckers. I'm just going to chill. Uh, those suckers you're just talking about, do you bring them indoors and then nurture, or do you just plan on recycling later? Kind of yeah, when I'm growing the suckers, I'll most likely bring them indoors during August and July and then put them back out as September, October rolls around. As soon as it gets cooler again, as soon as we're on the decline, you can put your tomato suckers back out or you can grab new transplants. All the garden nurseries will still have uh, transplants. So if you want to try out a new tomato, go get a new tomato. And just you want to be able to replace your sick tomato as September rolls around. And then as we put that new tomato plant in, we're just going to start the whole process over again. Yes. Exactly how do you cut off the, the suckers? The suckers, if it's if really it looks like a real sharp knife, mm -hmm. do you cut the, the leaf or whatever that's there also? Or? They'll be the tiniest bit of leaves and then a tiny bit of stem at the initial um, sucker growing, but then it'll soon just grow into a nice stem, big leaves, things like that. So if it's big, I'll use some scissors. I won't try to rip it off because if I try to rip it off, it'll most likely bring a strip of flesh of the actual tomato stem off. So if it's too big, I'll just use some sterile scissors, pruners or whatever, snip it right off as I'm doing my pruning. But if it's really tiny and you're just now seeing it, you just see these tiny two little leaves popping up out of the armpit, you can just pinch it off. You ever pop the sun whether they were really an inoculant before transplanting? You definitely can. I would always recommend fertilizing when you plant. I like to use a slow release organic fertilizer. Microlife makes a wonderful 846, and that's what I like to just sprinkle in as the directions say. And um, anytime I'm putting something in the ground, chuck some slow release fertilizer in there, you'll be good to go. And so, what does the timeline look like exactly? So, in mid January, we start our seeds. 80 days later, in late March, we're ready to put it outside. We put it outside and we start fertilizing for vegetative growth with our goal of getting to six to seven feet. No flowers, no fruits, none at all. Around May to June, 
our plant should be big enough and we're ready to focus on production only. No more vegetative growth. We are, we don't care about that anymore. Our plant is six feet tall. So we're just trying to focus on pumping out fruit before those August and July months roll around. As soon as those months roll around, we will let some suckers go. We'll pop the suckers off, put those inside until temperatures start to fall. We'll put those tomatoes back out around September and throughout September, December, we just do the entire process over again. We go right back to vegetative growth, no flowers, no fruits. We get to the size we want, and then we just keep producing fruit until that plant dies of frost, which should happen around New Year's. Uh, doing a lot of the volunteer farming that I do, I see people with tomato plants in December. It's Christmas time. I'm still harvesting peppers and tomatoes. Our last frost, our first frost in 2022 was, I think, December like 16th or so. And depending on the tomatoes you grow, you might still have them survive a little bit of abuse from, from freezing temperatures. But as soon as your plant dies in December or January, start it all over again. And that way we'll just have year-round tomatoes. That's the weird thing about July and August is that it's a, it's, it's a pain in the butt to have this giant linchpin of, well, I just want to grow through July and August instead of having to take a break through July and August. But July and August will be a pain in your butt, whether you do this or you try to grow through them. All right. Hey, hey. Sorry, I'm, I'm online. Can you hear me? One second. Hold on. All right. Can you say your question now? Yeah, I'm sorry. Whoa. You have a remote control for the Yeah, let me go to you. All right, try it now. Okay, is it better now? Better. Okay, so I am a novice gardener. I just started like a year and a half ago. I have a really hard time with uh, growing my seed, growing my plants from seeds. And I figured that's like also gonna, if, if I do try to bring in the uh, sucker, I figure it's gonna do the same thing. I think it's cause I don't have enough light. What do you suggest I do to keep my plants from dying <laughs> when they're inside? Um, you're going to want to put your lights very close to your plants, like six, five inches above your plants, depending okay. on the exact light you're using. If you're using T5s, which are just your normal shop lights, those are going to produce a lot of heat and might actually damage your tomato. So I okay. would, um, if you have a local hydroponic shop, if you're in Austin, bright ideas, love those people. But yeah, if you have a hydroponic shop near you, I would give them a call and ask them, Hey, what can I do to be a better seed starter? Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. So someone on the YouTube channel was asking about um, dealing with spider mites uh, and nematodes. Spider mites and nematodes. That's a good one. Um, neem oil is really the only organic treatment to those kinds of things that I'm aware of. Um, if you have a good garden hose that won't do too much damage but has enough pressure, to just spray them off and keep trying to spray them off. Uh, you might try putting a net or like a, um, a row cover over your tomato plants and introducing just a bunch of ladybugs to just eat whatever they can. That would be, that would be helpful. That's about all I'm aware of as far as treating those things organically anyway. Does anybody have any other tips on if, you, if you're dealing with a lot of nematodes, maybe try growing in pots, not directly on the ground. Um, that's a great way of avoiding those more pesky soil rooty nematodes. All right. So in here it says the plant garlic bulbs between the plants to protect them from wild fire So garlic bulbs. Companion planted will prevent the spider mites. All right. What tomato varieties do well in Central Texas? These are some of my favorites, um, but as a general rule of thumb, the smaller tomato you grow, the easier the time you will have. If you're trying to grow a three pound tomato, you're doing high risk, high reward. If you're doing cherry tomatoes, grape tomatoes, 
you can you can relax a little bit. You're gonna get a ton of tomatoes, even if you don't prune as much, even if you don't prevent diseases as well, you'll still get plenty of tomatoes. With that said, here are my favorites that just do not disappoint. Juliet, it's a great hybrid tomato. And uh, I've seen these tomatoes take everything. I've seen them take tons of rain, too much rain. I've seen them take harsh heats, still pump out fruit. I've seen them take frost in December. They still pump out fruit. And that's a picture of them in the top right. Uh, Jolene, which is a distant relative to the Juliet. It's a tomato that is produced specifically for hot climates. We are not in a hot climate. We are in a too hot climate. <laughs> a, hot, a hot climate's like Arizona, Oklahoma, something like that. We are in a too hot climate. Uh, but these can still go a little further than any other tomato you might try to grow outside. Cherokee purple, which is an heirloom tomato. This is a fan favorite of all the local gardeners in Central Texas. If you ask any tomato grower in Central Texas, what are you growing? I bet you 10 out of 10 times, they're gonna say I'm growing a Cherokee purple. They got great flavor. They got great production for being a hybrid. And they have a beautiful color to them too. Nice purpley tints. Uh, black crim, which you can see on the bottom left. That's one of my personal favorites. I've grown that one. That's what I had 70 pounds of tomatoes in my very first photo. And uh, you can get those through rare seeds, Baker Creek seeds. Baker Creek Seeds is a seed company out of Missouri, and they produce and cultivate a lot of heirloom seeds. So you can get a bunch of beautiful plants like that from there. Uh, and Sun Gold, which is a hybrid cherry tomato. This is the best tasting cherry tomato, period. Uh, if you can find them, they're very common. I'm sure all the garden nurseries will have the transplants for Sun Gold tomatoes. If they're not, just give them a call. Just call up whatever nursery is closest to you and just ask them, hey, are you, you going to bring in some sun golds or can you bring in some sun golds? I know Barton Creek Nursery takes special requests. So if they're not growing them, you can put in a request for them. Oh. <clears throat> the cherries that you have on there have the um, tender skins or tough skins. Gotcha. Yeah, those are our Juliets and they the skins are a little tough, a little light on the juice. And I would probably mash those into more of a paste than um, trying to eat them fresh, personally. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. What can I do about those pesky squirrels? Uh, so <laughs> I'm in a community garden downtown. I see tons of squirrels preying upon our tomatoes. I don't grow tomatoes in my community garden because every generation of squirrel that lives in that area knows to come around in May, June, and July to take whatever they want. So with that said, a lot of people have issues with, hey, a bird poked a hole in my tomato. Hey, a squirrel keeps taking my tomatoes. What can I do? So in the summertime, when all the natural water resources are really low or dried out, a lot of these animals are looking for a drink of water. They don't want your tomato. They want the fruit. They want the water content of your tomato. So if you're finding a lot of poked holes, a lot of bites in your tomato plants, that's a good indicator that they were just there for some water. So if you put out a little water feature, a little bird bath, a little fountain, even if it's solar powered, whatever you can do to provide them a little bit of drink of water as they make their way through your garden, they will leave your tomato plants alone. If you don't, if you already have like a really good sturdy trellis, you can also put a bird net around that trellis and that'll keep out birds and stuff like that as well. Another good way to reduce, reuse and recycle is to take berry containers and take them and put them right over your plants. You can clamp them shut right over the tomatoes and a squirrel will pop up. He'll be like, hey, that's crap. That's, I don't want to deal with this. And he'll just move on. And lastly, you can ripen your tomatoes on the counter. If you're seeing a little bit of blush on your tomato, that means it has all it needs to ripen. So you don't need to take your chances with ripening on the vine. People talk about how vine ripened tomatoes are the best tomato, but there really is not a big difference between a tomato that finishes on the vine or finishes on your counter. And it's gonna be a lot safer on your counter. Where that myth, where that myth really comes into play is when you're thinking about store-bought tomatoes. So for farms and stuff, they will grow their tomatoes to a nice, rich, 
light green, not a dark green. They'll grow them green. They'll pick them. They'll put them on the truck because they're going to transport a lot easier if they're green as opposed to ripe. Once they reach their warehouse, they're going to pump a bunch of sulfur gas on those tomatoes, forcing it to ripe. But it didn't ripen naturally. It didn't blush on the plant before they picked it. So as long as you get that blush, and tomato blush is on the bottom of your tomato, as it gets light green, it'll go to dark green. And towards the bottom, where the flower originally started, you'll start to see a little bit of like a darker burgundy red hue. Once you see that red hue, your tomato's good to go. You can take it off the plant, you can leave it on the plant, but it doesn't need anything else to ripen. Put like red Christmas balls. <laughs> mm. I've heard about people making these with strawberry stones. Ah. They go down. Oh, that was, you know, well, the theory of that is in particular to help protect from birds because birds are territorial mm -hmm. and you're usually going to have the same birds. So you put those. The red Christmas balls or whatever out early before your tomatoes turn color. The birds come and try to eat them, and it's like, oh, this is no good. And they they sort of learn that those red things are not good. Now it's not hundred percent, but every bird that, that doesn't want to eat it is a is a plus. That that's fantastic. Yeah, I love the idea of putting out a little red Christmas ornament on your tomato plants before you get the fruit. The birds come in, they investigate. And also, I've had some good results. You were talking about using a plastic container. You can get those organza bags on Amazon that mm -hmm. they use for wedding favors and stuff in all different sizes. And I've had that help to some extent. Now, the leaf footed bugs are still going to stick their snouts through that and get your tomato, but it still helps some. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I've been there. I've been like, I want to grow the heaviest, largest pound tomato I possibly can. I had a big two and a half, three pound tomato growing on my vine. And next thing I know, one little sucker comes by, takes a bite out of it. My whole day is ruined. My week is ruined. My month is ruined. I don't even want to tell people I'm growing tomatoes because I'm ashamed. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, don't psych yourself out. Don't, don't set yourself up for that disappointment. All right. Now, where should I plant my tomatoes? It's a great question. Your tomato plants need at least eight hours of sunlight. If you don't get eight hours of sunlight, you're gonna have a much worse time growing tomatoes. And I would maybe recommend try and grow something that's a leafy vegetable over a fruiting vegetable. Fruiting vegetables need a lot of light to do what they do. And leafier greens can take, take a lot of shade. So just keep that in mind. You don't have to grow tomatoes or if you can grow them indoors under artificial lights, that's also a perfectly good option. You're gonna to wanna to look for a spot that gets the most amount of direct morning sunlight as possible. Morning sunlight is the best sunlight for any garden, period. Morning sunlight is gonna be still very direct. It's gonna be a lot softer because temperatures are coming up, not at the peak for that day. So it'll be 60, 70 degrees and you're getting your direct light. But if it's in the afternoon, say at 3 p.m. and you get afternoon sunlight instead of morning sunlight, that sunlight's going to be a lot harsher. It's going to be a warmer temperature. It's going to feel a little overbearing for your tomato. That isn't to say if you only have afternoon sun, don't grow tomatoes. If you have afternoon sun, you're fine. I just want to give you the best practice, not the only practice. All right. Um, tomatoes love it at 80 degrees. And while they can do their job at 100 degrees, they're going to be more comfortable in temperatures that you're more comfortable in. Can I grow in containers? So as we saw in my third series of photos where I grew exclusively in containers, you definitely can grow tomatoes. I grew peppers, okra, tomatoes. I grew it all in, in fabric pots and had amazing results. Uh, we first need to make sure we pick the right tomato for the job though. Determinate tomatoes are gonna be our best tomatoes for containers. If you have a little five gallon pot, throw a determinate tomato in there. Do not put a indeterminate tomato and a five gallon pot. You will not be happy. Um, in, uh, determinate tomatoes don't even really need a lot of trellising. If you have those Texas, I mean, if you have those normal cone shaped tomato cages, you can use those for determinate tomatoes, but you can't use those for indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, determinate tomatoes don't need a lot of structure, but you can give them a little bit of structure. It's, it's 
whatever you so choose. Uh, for determinate tomatoes, you're going to want a pot that is about seven to 10 gallons minimum for just one plant. Uh, for indeterminate tomatoes, you're going to want a 20 to 30, 40, 50, 100 gallon. A tomato plant, an indeterminate tomato plant is going to want as much soil as you can possibly provide. But don't go anywhere under these, any, in, anywhere under these parameters. Seven gallons is your the lowest amount you can get away with. It's not recommended, but it's what you can get away with. Um, fruiting plants typically need at least a foot deep of, of space for their roots. Uh, lettuces and stuff like that need just a few inches, so something to keep in mind. Watering is gonna be especially important when you're, when you're growing in pots. Pots are gonna dry out a lot faster than a raised bed or an in-ground bed, so you, well, you can't skip on checking out your, your fabric pots. If I didn't go out in the garden for two days to my fabric pot garden, my stuff would die. It's, it's just gonna be that easy. And, but you can set up little ways of making sure that your garden's watered if it's a fabric or a container garden. Uh, Oyas are used here at Zilker. Those are a nice, beautiful, porous clay pot that you submerge in the ground. And it's like a little tank of water that just bleeds water out to your soil. Uh, you can put in an upside down bottle and gravity will slowly feed it, just to give you some ideas. Avoid black containers. If you put a tomato in a black container, its roots will get baked by the sun and it's just gonna die. It's, don't, put, don't use black pots in Texas as a, as a general rule of thumb. And you're gonna wanna look for a potting mix as opposed to a potting soil. And there's weird differences in there we don't really need to get into, but just if you're going to try to make soil, use a potting mix, not a potting soil. I also like to add a lot of slow release fertilizers to my pots. Pots, will gonna, pots are going to leak out your nutrients a lot faster than erosion will in an in-ground bed or a raised bed. So you're going to want to fertilize a little bit more if you do decide to go with containers. And on the left here, you can just see a good amount of perfect tomatoes to use for uh, containers. We have our big boy bush. That's a nice slicing determinate tomato. Bush champion, another determinate tomato. Bush early girl, which is one of the most popular tomatoes grown in our Northern states, because this will give them a good head start. It gets you tomatoes as fast as possible. They're not the best, but I mean, the, the tomatoes you grew will still be better than whatever's in Whole Foods. Uh, patio F tomato, great tomato, nice cherry tomato, patio princess, another cherry tomato, and window box Roma, also another determinant. So determinants, better for containers, indeterminates, better for your raised beds and, and ground gardens. These are just more of my photos. Any more questions? Go for it. You talked about making sure that the branches don't rub against each other. What do you do? in that situation one of them's got to go <laughs> so you just prune it off yeah prune it off i pruned incredibly heavily like at some point i was planting my tomatoes about every 10 inches between them which is insane your tomato plants want two feet three feet but i will put my tomatoes right up next to each other wow. and just prune even heavier so i like to go really heavy on the pruning if it seems like a waste to like chuck off an entire branch of tomato but sometimes you just got to do it just for the health of your tomato. Uh, you said February 20th, you start your seeds? Uh, around January 15th or so. January 15th. Yeah. So if you haven't started tomato seeds, it's a little late for you. Just look for transplants. We got a wonderful litany of nurseries that will satisfy and your the needs. the plant sale. Yes, and the plant sale. <laughs> In the back. Yeah, if any of you want this presentation, uh, I'll just grab a pen and paper and you can jot down your email and I will send you this entire presentation. Yeah. No notes needed. You'll the just recording's have that. on the YouTube channel yes. too. And the recording is also on the YouTube channel. It'll be there right after this. And you can rewatch all that technical stuff, which I'll edit out later. Thank you. <laughs> so what additives can you use to prevent cracking after heavy rain? Gotcha. Yeah. Cracking is a big problem. If your tomato plants are getting too much water and there's fruit on them, you're going to see some cracking. So again, anytime you're gardening vegetables, you're at the whim of the weather. And something you're going to want to do is make sure you're constantly checking the weather. If you're seeing a forecast of a bunch of rain coming in, 
you should expect some tomatoes to crack. And what we can do is again, look for that blush, confirm that our tomatoes are ripening in the process of ripening and just take them straight inside. And that'll be the best way to combat um, tomato cracking. But if your tomatoes are in a pot, you can also move that pot underneath some cover where it's not gonna get down poured on and over water your tomatoes, which will create cracking. Okay. Uh, someone on the, uh, the Zoom asked, what about blight? Blight is gonna happen pretty much no matter what, especially if you're in a more humid climate like we are. We're not in Houston, so they're, they're blight city apparently. But um, the more humid you are, the more chances you are going to get blight. I don't. I get plenty of blight on my tomatoes, even though I prune them heavily, keep them in great condition. I love them, I nurture them, but I still get some blight. You can still grow with blight, but if you see blight developing early on and it's it's only secluded to like a leaf or a stem, you can take that stem off and hopefully save the rest of your plant. If you catch it as early as possible, you can keep it from spreading to the rest of your plant. Um, and then how often do you fertilize your potted tomatoes? I'll try to fertilize my potted tomatoes every three weeks. So if I'm in ground or in raised beds, I'll fertilize once a month, once every six weeks. But in pots, I'm going to try to fertilize every three weeks. And I'm going to try to adhere to that. Um, and then on YouTube, someone asked about companion compatible plants. Mm, I'm going to get a little controversial here. I don't like companion planting tomatoes. When we talked about, I want bare stems at the bottom eight inches of my tomato plants, that's to allow a lot of good airflow. So if I put a marigold there, yeah, it's gonna prevent a lot of pests to come in at my tomato, but I'm gonna start trapping more humidity there. But the, that isn't to say that you shouldn't companion plant tomatoes. Tons of people do it. You can put beets there, you can put carrots there. We talked about garlic bulbs. And you can put marigolds there to help avoid other pest issues. Maybe just a little further away. What especially about if they... planting the marigolds in their own pot and putting it, you know, you got tomato, tomato, and put the marigold here, sort of in that. Yeah, in the vicinity, but not overcrowding the exact tomato space. I like that. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could still see that being a great addition to, to your growing method. Um. So yeah, so someone was agreeing with what you were saying about blasting with water. There's even like spray nozzles for hoses, like for using water as a to remove insects. Um, so let's see. Is this tomato good for health because it's hybrid? Hmm. Like, is there anybody that, yeah. Do you know anything about yeah. hybridizing? Hybridizing tomatoes are tomatoes that are not really bred, but they're created. It's sort of I'm splicing qualities that I really, really want. So if I want blight resistance, I'm going to splice in a tomato or maybe something that's not a tomato. Maybe it's a potato that's blight resistant. I'm going to bring those genes in. But if I'm breeding tomatoes, I'm only taking a tomato and a tomato. But if I'm hybridizing, I'm using the entire animal kingdom to my to my whim. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, hybrid is like selective breeding. It's a it's a mishmash. Personally, my opinion is everything's GMO. Bananas are GMO because we we just bred we we technically did that intervention, whether it was natural or not. Eh, I don't really necessarily think it's worth arguing over hey i have a gmo tomato plant i have a non-gmo tomato plant it's all good it's all good um so what can you do in regards to growing tomatoes in extreme heat last summer leaves and flowers keep dropping um early fall i was about to throw out my plant yeah if you again if you're checking the weather and it's 68 at night there's not much you can do. Maybe you can put out a mobile AC unit to, to artificially bring in some, some different microclimates to, to pray for fruit. But if it's 68 at nighttime, it's just not gonna happen. I would say try to grow them indoors if you can. There's a wonderful book called Gardening Under Lights by Leslie Halleck. I love this book. It helps you do everything when it comes to growing anything indoors. If it's a house plant, if it's a succulent, if you're seed starting, if you're crazy person trying to grow tomatoes inside as opposed to outside, you're going to want this book. 
there is a whole heaping of dimensions that you're going to learn about what it comes down to when it comes to lights and plants. It's not as simple as put light over plant, plant happy. It's way deeper than that. So get that book. How do you spell her name or his name? Leslie Halleck. I Halleck. I'll pull up that book. Oh. I don't quite remember how to spell it. Uh. Hold on. H A L L E C K. Leslie Howell. Uh, I do a lot of these presentations and I try to bring some of these books, but this is this is my premier book. If if you're gardening, you're gonna want this book. Any other questions? You, yes, you mentioned that tomatoes like to ramble along the ground. Is, has anybody ever tried planting them that way? Does that work? Oh yeah, there's everybody in the gardening space experimenting with everything possible. Some people are like, well, maybe soap will help me get better tomatoes. So they'll just dump a bunch of soap in the ground. Everybody's experimenting. So there's, I've seen plenty of people that are like, I'm just going to try to do a horizontal tomato method. You're going to get tomatoes. They're going to be covered in all sorts of weird things, maybe bugs that are eating in there, but it'll, it'll work. It just won't look pretty and it'll be a, a mess. I think Boggy Creek, yeah, I've heard they sure. do the, they just kind of let them go on the ground and sprawl. Yeah. Boggy Creek wondering. Farms. And my question spins off of that sun scald. I have a very hot west afternoon sun. Mm -hmm. And if all the leaves have been picked off, for things that are you're not wanting to keep shade underneath. Um, what to do about sun scald? Uh, I would still make sure I have a nice bed of mulch. Um, that'll keep everything pretty happy. But maybe facing that sun, you can put up a, a small structure of like some sort of barrier to the sun. If you can put up uh, two poles and a shade cloth, that'll go a long ways in in okay. keeping that sun from really beating down your plants. You can make little greenhouses pretty easily. And typically for like a poly plastic, you're gonna want a whole lot more rings than you would for a shade, a shade cloth. So a shade cloth can be a lot more like moving in the winds. It doesn't have to be tight. So a shade cloth is a lot easier to put up than a little greenhouse. So just keep that in mind. I think I got blossom and brought last year and I started them from seed when I know it has to do with watering and consistent watering, mm -hmm. but is it like its whole life time or is that really when you start from seed and size that is You can also see a lot of blossom and rot from like nutrient deficiencies. Like sometimes you'll have a bunch of calcium in the soil, but it's not plant available calcium. So I would try to add um, maybe some rock dust, maybe some azomites, just in your soil right now, not with the tomatoes, but as soon as possible. Uh, maybe try to introduce a little bit more organic matter. Isn't it sulfur too breaks down? Yes. You can sulfur. Get, you can get some sulfur and shoot some gas over your tomato plants. Your neighbors are going to think you farted something rancid, but it'll help. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> All right. Is it? Is that it? Is any other questions? We're getting down to the. Yeah. Thank you, Austin. Given us some deep. All right. Thanks, everyone, out on um, Zoom. We're going to say.